Well, welcome everyone uh, to our July edition of Future Work Scotland. Thrilled to be back with you. I'm your uh, co I'm your host uh, for this session, uh, Sat Paul Singh of the Cosme Sath, and I'm joined by my co-organizer and co-host, Donald Henderson. A uh, number of you have been with us before, so you know you know the you know you know the formalities, you know the drill. In terms of code of conduct, we simply ask that you are respectful to one another. We want everyone to great experience. Uh, we'll do some community shout outs at the end. You've probably seen some of our social media posts. Donald and I are supporting a number of different events over the next wee while. So we will just remind you of what some of those are. Very exciting and hopefully you'll get involved. Uh, and we'll take questions at the end. So feel free to drop them in the in the chat, prefix them with the queue so Donald can spot them. Uh, but if there are points and you do put in a question and we think it's one that would be relevant for Thor to pick up now, uh, then we will, we will try to interject without interrupting his flow. Uh, and with that, I am absolutely thrilled to welcome Thor Olofsson. I'm a big fan of Thor's work. We've been speaking for quite some time. I've done a number of talks myself over the last year and a half where I have given a nod to what Thor does. Um, and Donald's holding up the book. So Thor's got extensive experience. He, he's worked, it's a very, very impressive uh, career journey he's had. He's been doing this stuff a long time. He's the founder and chief exec of Strategic Leadership Group. He's worked in, I think it's 30 countries. That's absolutely remarkable. Uh, and really his, his passion is conscious leadership and it's kind of become one of my, my passions as well. I think we do need to look fresh at the kind of leadership we need in organizations moving forward. And as Donald was holding up there, he's written this tremendous book, Beyond Ego, which I, I am a huge fan of. And in the book, you know, he talks a lot about the journey into conscious leadership through the inner compass. So delighted to have him here for the session to help us learn more. Uh, without further ado, what is your store? Thank you, Seth. Thank you. And uh, hi to everyone. Super happy to be here. Can you hear me clearly, Seth? Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, yes, I, I'd like to uh, start by sharing uh, a, a slide and then uh, take you through. Um, hold on. Yes, it's working, right? Okay. So yes, my name is Thor Olafsson. I've been working in Germany since 2004 and uh, traveled with German global corporations around the world doing leadership development. And thank you for the nice introduction, Seth. And uh, I'd like to kick us off into this uh, talk about leading beyond ego. And uh, we definitely in our work around the world see the need for that. And thankfully see people increasingly moving in that direction, especially the younger generation seem to be much more aware of who they are and when they are at their best and not at their best. Um, and when we lead beyond the ego, it increases engagement. We've seen that, the productivity, interestingly, and loyalty. So uh, to kick us off, uh, I'd like to start with uh, this guy here. Uh, let me see if we can get this to work. Yep. This young person is about one year old in that picture. And uh, you can see he's wearing a, a cast on his right leg. And uh, he, as I understand, was to, um, he, he wore that for a bit longer until he was about two and then had to wear a cast um, at night. His leg was strapped into a cast because he was born with a clubbed foot that was completely twisted, toes pointing backwards. What's interesting about this story is that his mother was a professional ballet dancer uh, a disciplinarian, uh, someone who was not going to accept this and forced the first operation through when he was about six days old. And then um, he got trained on, you know, walking normally, despite one leg being shorter and, and, and weaker. And also trained on not feeling sorry for himself. You can do this yourself. You don't need any help, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so fast forward into management career. Uh, what are some of the ego patterns of this young man once he had uh, um, started his career? It was 
struggling to delegate because that's a shown of uh, a sign of weakness wanting to do everything uh, himself um, needing to show personal strength etc and you know the slide asks what is ego what what is it really and and what we have found that it's not a freudian definition by any means it's it's a conscious and and, and subconscious story uh, about who we are and it's a recipe that secures our survival in this world and um, uh, this guy uh, came to believe that you need to be strong. You need to be someone who um, can definitely show that he doesn't need any help. And um, that story, when it's being told over and over again, becomes something that he identifies with and something that he then needs to protect. It, it is his identity. And um, if we go a little bit further into ego, uh, we could say that we all have it. We all tell our stories about who we are. And uh, our inner selves are relaxed and having fun and uh, not too stressed about how we come across. And then we all have this little guy. And uh, our ego is, is, is cute and manageable until something comes up and this, this look comes up. And it can go really quick, you know, from nice to uh, not so nice. And we see that the ego patterns tend to come out when we have a moment of insecurity for some reason. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, when we have a moment of feeling insecure, uh, really, really quickly, a feeling rushes uh, through, uh, a thought follows it, and we take action or we freeze. So uh, fight or freeze or flee or even fawn. So we take action or we do not take action. But typically, it, if, if, if it's something that's happening really fast and we're not having enough time to process it, we regret taking the action or we regret having not taken any action. And we really need to uh, learn how to push a pause button. And, um, you know, we... We find that we, we all have it. We all have uh, an ego, uh, an inner, more calm self, and then an ego that can be really quick to react. And if we take it a little bit further, based on genes and upbringing, debate is still out on nature versus uh, uh, nurture, but based on who we are and what we've come to believe is our uh, best survival mechanism, we can identify some very clear ego patterns. And, you know, when you follow the different patterns that I'm going to show you, it, it might make it more interesting to reflect on yourselves or maybe your boss, even more fun, uh, or some colleagues at work or family members, you know, who is which has which pattern. And uh, you'll see on the left-hand side in just a moment, the, the name of the pattern. And then on the right-hand side, how it secures survival. In which way does that ego pattern keep this person safe? Just like the young guy in the cast, uh, having that strict upbringing and, and, and not being allowed to show any weakness, his ego pattern was about being strong and showing that he could do it on himself, on, on his own. And so you, you can guess which ego pattern that guy uh, is. So here's the first one, the judge, the perfectionist, um, doing things right and being perfect. If my room's clean, my grades are good, I do really well uh, at work, uh, no spelling mistakes, you know, absolutely brilliant report that I turned in, I won't be criticized. Um, these people tend to see life through a pair of glasses where through one lens, they see the world as it should be. And uh, the other lens, they see it as it is. And they can never quite make it come together. And this applies to both themselves, how they see themselves when they look in the mirror. This is how I should be. This is how I am. And there's always a gap. So they can also, they're also called the reformers. Um, and uh, 
they have been found in disproportionately high numbers in management positions in religious organizations. Surprise, surprise. The judge uh, likes the Ten Commandments. They give you a clear guideline. The number two is very different. The helper. Someone who uh, you'll hear them say, oh, uh, would you, do you need something? Can I bring you a cup of coffee? Uh, would you like help with that? You know, and, and they're doing this all the time. And it's, uh, it seems very, very helpful, but it has an agenda. Uh, sorry, it seems very, very positive and, and, and nice, but it has an agenda uh, because they, they do often expect something in return. And if they are helpful to those in power, they receive protection. Um, the third one, uh, I, I did personal development courses when I was younger and, and I still do some of them. And the third one never shows up to one of those. They're too busy. Uh, they're, too, they're too good at things anyway. They're called the winners. Um, they'll be the best at sports, the best at um, work, best at sales, best at pretty much everything because they measure their um, success and their security in measurable um, things like titles, money, things, etc. And the belief is I, I'm respected if I am standing at the top of the podium. So that's the top. The first three, number four, uh, is a very interesting one, uh, the individualist. And uh, when I was growing up, the individualists would be these, you know, we'd have 150, 200 kids in the schoolyard uh, during breaks. And then two of them would be punk rockers, you know, with a, with a mo mohican, uh, what's it called, the, 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 the haircut and uh, mohawk, yeah. And, and earrings and, and, and whatever, piercings all over the place. And I think today they're more goths than, than punk rockers. But um, the cool thing about this one is that, you know, your rules don't apply to me. I'm, I'm different. I'm, uh, you don't understand me, so you can't judge me, which is a really um, interesting uh, defense mechanism and something that they, you know, need to believe in strongly to um, stay safe in their view. Then we have the investigator. We see a lot of this one in um, German engineering driven uh, corporations. Um, and in fact, in a lot of corporations, we see the investigator, someone who really, really believes in information is power. And if I know more than, than Donald and Seth and everyone here, you know, I have the upper hand in some way and that makes me safe. And, uh, and if they're managers, they will be asking for all kinds of information uh, that maybe their predecessor didn't ask for. They want backup to the backup uh, reports, uh, detail, explaining the details. And um, they, they can be good at human relations, but often they are so deep into their um, investigative work, they're gathering information that they uh, are a bit reclusive and not very skilled at, at human relations. Those are the first five. We still have a few more to go. So um, uh, maybe you found yourself, maybe you found your boss, maybe you found the young men in the cast. Let's see. Uh, here comes number six, the loyalist. Very safety oriented, small comfort zone in life, but everything inside that comfort zone is neat and organized and safe. They're hardworking, dependable and committed. And I'll be loyal to you if you're loyal to me and that gives security. And I remember, you know, I was explaining this one in a seminar and, um, and these are the types that you probably all know you've, you have smoke detectors in your homes. And when the battery starts to get weak, it gives a warning signal like beep, 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 uh, meaning you should change the battery. The number six here, the loyalists, they change the batteries before the beep starts. Uh, they you can just sense it. It's, it's, you know, they're better safe than sorry. And I had this young woman and she had taken a test that we use. I'll tell you about that later. And she'd found out to, that she's this type. And then here, here's about the uh, smoke detector thing and starts grinning. And, and I ask her what it is. And she says, it's not just the smoke detector tour. I'm the safety person at the, at the workplace where I work. I, I do the safety drills. Uh, so it was a uh, pretty, pretty spot on. And, uh, and that's her survival mechanism. That's what keeps her safe. 
Number seven, again, totally different, the enthusiast. Um, busy starting various initiatives, sorry for the spelling mistake, projects, events, really believing that more is more. Let me throw everything I have at it and see if something sticks. Uh, and if they stay busy, and this is, uh, this is also very interesting from a psychological point of view, if I stay super busy, what is it or who is it that I do not really have to deal with? And, uh, you know, there's no quiet moment where I have to deal with myself. So they stay safe in the sense of escaping reality. So uh, second to last type, the boss, the strongest, the most powerful, the alpha male. And uh, their safety is I'm simply at the top of the food chain. I've always been, always will be. And it probably does not surprise you that when people have done studies in senior uh, teams in, in large corporations, the number of these is disproportionately high. And uh, we've done uh, a lot of this for the last 10, 15 years, and we, we see uh, that, that being confirmed. They always have a funny face, though, when I ask them, do you know where else the number of number eight, the boss, is disproportionately high? And uh, they never get it, but they, they, they look a bit, you know, some of them laugh to give them credit. Uh, it's in prison populations. Um, they're definitely... Uh, so strong-willed and want to go their own way that either they play by the law or on the other side of the law. The final one you've probably seen a lot, uh, the peacemaker, the, the harmonious person, the wallflower, a blends in, not very noticed, which is a way of staying safe. And uh, the peacemaker is, um, we call them the number nine. They can they're flexible, they can take on some of the forms of the other ones, but they, um, they are the, the ones that when they were little, they, they would just, if things got too hectic or, you know, mom and dad were ang uh, arguing, you just fade out, you just disappear to your room or make yourself as small as possible. So, um, you know, we, we realized that all of these patterns, they didn't start in the mid thirties or, or when we started going to work in, in corporations, they started when we were kids and, um, or they were there when we were born, but we, we see definitely how they got enhanced and developed in, in childhood. And, um, so these are the, the nine that we look at most intensively. And you can be a mix of, of all of, uh, of uh, sorry, of, of several of these. But um, what happens if we overinterpret these? We, we find ourselves insecure and we go too far. And, uh, and what we, you know, let's take the boss. Let's, let's paint up a scenario with the boss. The one that's uh, alpha, alpha male type. Um, and let's say an, uh, an employee makes a mistake and this boss reacts poorly to the employee's mistake. Uh, it could be in the form of tone of voice was a little bit out of line. The choice of words was inappropriate and, um, and maybe they were upset and they couldn't quite control it. And the employee feels hurt by the conversation. And this is probably not a surprise, becomes a little bit apprehensive towards that boss. You know, if, if, uh, if a volunteer is being asked for, they might not be the first one anymore to raise their hand because if things go wrong, uh, you will get a hiding. You, you will really be scolded. And that's something they do not care too much for. Now, this is a, it's not true for everyone, but let's take it a little bit further and say, let's say this happens to one person and then, more employees have similar experiences. Word gets out, watch out for that manager. You know, he can really give you a, a tough time if you make a mistake. So, you know, best way, please don't make mistakes. Um, if this happens, people show less initiative. They're afraid of risk. And seeing as we work in large corporations for the last 20 something years, me and my team, we see, we come into organizations that are fear driven. And uh, they'll do what they're being told, but nothing more uh, because they're afraid of being hurt. They're afraid of being, uh, yeah. And um, 
at scale, creativity and innovation are reduced. And if that happens, you know, because they're afraid of risk, then automatically creativity and innovation are reduced. Companies development slows down and the competitive edge has been blunted. And, you know, we, we come into organizations and I'm, I'm going to show you a video about this uh, in a little bit, uh, what happens when, when people go, uh, so to say, below the line and into defensive mode. But, um, that's where silos get created and that's where people stop talking to each other. And we come into these organizations where we see managers not being conscious of their leadership style, not being conscious of their ego and ego patterns and having effects like this, causing people to hold back and then complaining about the people not being proactive enough. And, and we really have to challenge them on, so whose fault is that really then? if you guys have been the bosses for the last 10 years. Um, but okay, let's, let's take a look at um, Google and, and what Google did to understand um, wh what's a really effective team. And, and why am I bringing that up? Well, there are not many parties in the world, companies or universities or, or that can, that have the resources that Google has. And, uh, they did a highly interesting study on what's a good manager and then followed it up with what's a, a super effective team. And you may be familiar with this, but there were five key themes that came out of following 180 teams for a period of um, years, uh, a few years. And here are the five. And the first one up top is psychological safety. Team members feel safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. So if I had the boss that I just showed you here, I wouldn't fit into that category. I wouldn't say that I was on a team where I can say what I want to say. Um, and we see a lot of that. So, uh, and we're focused on that one mostly now, psychological safety in this, uh, in this talk with you, because Someone else studied team effectiveness. His name is uh, Patrick Lencioni. He came out with a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And accompanying that book is a test that shows whether your team is functional or dysfunctional. And we use it a lot in our work. And essentially, he says that the, the basis is you need vulnerability-based trust. That's what Lencioni says. If I feel I can be vulnerable, on my team and ask for help or admit a weakness or a mistake. Um, it's the same as psychological safety. So Google and Patrick Lencioni are pretty much talking about the same thing, vulnerability-based trust in psychological safety. And the test, I'm about to show you a few questions from the test uh, that Patrick Lencioni uses to, to find out whether teams are functional or not. And you know what I was asking myself is, do the statements that I'm supposed to uh, evaluate in, in the test touch upon ego? Do they trigger ego, yes or no? And uh, let's take a look at it. Team members admit their mistakes. Does that trigger egos? I think that's an obvious one. Um, team members are passionate and unguarded. That's the key, unguarded. In their discussions, nope, the ego won't necessarily allow that because there are people on this team that could use that against me if I'm too unguarded. Team members are quick to point out the contribution of others on the team. This one was, a lot of people hesitate on this one and say, well, this one's about praise. And then some other ones catch on pretty quickly and say, yeah, you don't want to praise that other guy. He's gotten too much limelight lately. You know, he's going he's gonna to cast a shadow on the other ones. So let's not praise him. Uh, ego all over the place. and. Um, and we realize through our work with, with these clients that, you know, human nature is, I need to survive. And uh, I tell myself a story about who I am over and over and over again until I start to really believe it and see nothing else. When that story gets attacked, I react as if I was being physically attacked. And um, as a result, everyone has their potential wounds 
walks around protective of those wounds, not wanting to give any, you know, anyone an opportunity to hurt them. And as a result, we're not open. We're not free. We're defensive. To explain this a little bit better, um, I'd like to show you a video. It comes from the Conscious Leadership Group, which is a brilliant uh, resource and, and a good place to, to, to check out uh, if you're interested in conscious leadership, they are absolutely brilliant. And this video captures it so well. So let me play this video and then uh, offer you to uh, uh, um, have a conversation via chat afterwards. So let's see if it plays. And Donald, I can see you on my screen. So if you could give me a thumbs up if the sound is working. Okay, so here we go. One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? To themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money or time or space or energy or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control, or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question, we are hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat, and when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. All right. One. Okay, hold on. I am muted. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. So um, here's a, a screenshot of one of the last moments. And uh, what, what would be really cool to hear see in the chat is what goes through your mind when you when you watch that video and when you watch one of those final screenshots from the video. Uh, thank you, Saf, for uh, your comment. Anyone else? What what goes through your mind when you watch it? 
one of the comments we get a lot is, is anyone either uh, above or below? And no, uh, we're always uh, fluctuating between the two. And something can pull us quickly below the lines. And, uh, and then it's our responsibility to find a way to get back above it. And um, what's really interesting about this is, you know, and, and, and apologies to anyone who has, you know, want is wanting to make the comment that uh, dinosaurs and humans never existed at the same time. That's a bit of a glitch in the, in the drawing. But the point is that they are afraid uh, of, uh, you know, um, for their lives in that picture. So on the right hand side, a chemical cocktail rushes through our brain and, and nervous system. When we feel threatened, our life is endangered. But po people often do not realize that on the left hand side, the guy carrying the globe, that's a, a scarcity mindset. And it creates the same cocktail of, of, um, that rushes through our brain and nervous system. We feel threatened. And uh, here's the question. Okay, hold on. Um, I realize that I have an amazing management. They encourage above the line behavior. We flourish more because we're allowed to experiment. Brilliant. You should be thankful for that. Uh, find exact position of me, how to identify, uh, well, that comes in a little bit. Next slide is on how do we become more conscious of where we're at uh, in this and in general. And uh, I love the question here, Nick. Um, how do you protect yourself when easily pulled down the line? Um, a lot of things can be pulling us below the line all the time if we allow them. And we literally need to train ourselves to, if we are pulled below the line, we can climb back up quickly. So let's, let's take a look at how can we become more conscious of where are we above or below the line and how are we affecting others? And here are some of the methods that we have experimented with through the years. Some of them we learned from others. Some of them we've been developing on our own. So uh, here's the first one. We use personality profiling tools a lot. Uh, a, a very easy, quick one is Gallup Strength Finder. Uh, the nine personalities that I uh, explained the ego, uh, used to explain the ego patterns come from the Enneagram. And MDI Insights is absolutely brilliant, as painful as it is. And I'll give you an example. I, I read mine and it says, you know, uh, director in, you know, in a leadership position and it's describing me quite well. And then it says what my character is like. And I go, yep, 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 yep. That's a pretty good test. And then it says, this is how Tor looks under moderate pressure when he's stressed. And things start popping up in the list where I'm going like, yeah, I don't know about that one, you know, and I'm, but I, I say, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can relate to some of these. And so I guess it's true as well. And then I turn a page and it says, this is what Tor looks like under extreme pressure. And I'm reading out the list and I go, no, 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 that's not me. And my team's going, uh-huh, that's very much you. Um, so how do we become more aware? by getting learning ways to self-reflect and seeing different sides to ourselves. Sometimes the personality profiling tools are the right place to start. They certainly are an easy place to start compared to some of the other things. A timeline exercise is underrated. Some people have done it and it's been life-changing uh, and I'm definitely one of them. Uh, it's basically looking back on your life and mapping the biggest events and how they affected you. And there can be several aha moments within one or two hours uh, of people really sitting there and, and being with their life in that way. Um, another one is 360 degree insight. How do I become more aware? Well, I have my own story about who I am, Tor. You know, I've known him for a long time. But interesting in 360 insights, other people see other sides of me. It's very much a Joe Hari window type of thing that I thought they didn't see or I thought they saw differently. So that wakes me up. Work with the subconscious. Um, we 
we love to have uh, people in, in programs with us um, realizing the difference between actively using my brain to think and then uh, shutting it down to a degree and uh, listening to my intuition. Um, is it the subconscious? Definitely a deeper part of our brain, at least. So that is doable. Sometimes mindfulness and meditation can help. And uh, what we find is that with mindfulness and meditation, we are, are more resistant to uh, external stimuli or, or aggravation, and which also helps us stay above the line, despite some people around us uh, being in a very negative state, scarcity mindset, wanting to pull us with them below the line. And then we have something that is available to most people who, uh, at least all of those who do not work entirely alone, um, support from colleagues and team members. And it's, uh, it's almost never used. But usually when we find people who've used it actively, we find very mature individuals. They've said, oh, listen, can you give me feedback on today's meeting? I'm, I'm not sure how I came across. Was I too aggressive? Was, you know, was I too uh, dominant? Uh, or in, in the upcoming meeting, could you nudge me if I go into that pattern that we talked about? Just simply having someone around you that you trust that can actually call you out in those moments where you're not where you want to be. And that also drives awareness. And then we have the inner compass. And um, Sath spoke uh, fondly about my book in the beginning, and I'm very appreciative of that. The inner compass is a tool that... Um, I'm going to be very straightforward with you. I, I'm going to say it came to me. I, I'm not sure that I uh, developed it. I certainly did work on it once it was there, but I'll tell you more about it in a little bit. It looks like this, and it's covered uh, in the book. And the story behind this is the following. I had been studying executive coaching in London uh, with some great people for two years and I went on a graduation trip with my teacher and another uh, fellow student they came to Iceland uh, which is my home country and we spent some time out in nature uh, in wonderful weather and we were meditating out in nature and during that meditation I I have this uh, strong voice in my head saying you know, uh, you need to work more towards the enlightened leader. And uh, I wasn't sure what that meant, but it was very strong. And it, it literally said the enlightened leader. And I went back to the car with my uh, teacher and colleague and, uh, and I was very quiet. I was very thoughtful. And she asked me, my teacher, what, what had been going on? And, um, and I shared it with her and she gasps for air and says, well, I I registered the domain uh, a few months ago, the enlightened leader. So I don't know if she, she had said something in the trainings or something that had prompted me, but we felt very aligned in that moment. But at the same time, my clients uh, in leadership development are um, German engineers. And I did not want them to say, you know, please do not bring some esoteric, uh, you know, whatever into, into our work. So I was afraid. It was my ego pattern to, to uh, not do anything about this until a friend told me, ask, ask for help. And uh, through a series of meditations, um, through a series of meditations, um, these elements started to come through. And uh, the first one that came was humility. And I didn't understand why. I understand it now. And I'm just going to talk through it in a little bit. And I also didn't understand why it was placed there in the compass, not at the top, some more prominent place. So um, I'd like to walk you through the compass, and then we can open up for questions when I'm when I'm done. And uh, what is it really about? We when we teach it, we start with truth. And the, obviously the question, the big question is, what is the truth about me? Who am I? Who am I really? Um, 
if my ego patterns were developed as a defensive mechanism, and just as a hypothetical question, if I could lay them to the side and be without them, would I do it and be free of them? Most people are not too keen to put it to the side because that's what they've identified with their whole lives. What if there could be a different me behind that pattern? So we challenge our thinking on truth and, uh, and ask ourselves, okay, somewhere in the truth about me, there will be things that are more meaningful to me than others. They're more purposeful. And in those, I could either uh, find a bouquet of flowers, let's say several different things that all are purposeful to me, or, or more clearly one, one clear purpose. Regardless of which one it is, uh, we then go to, okay, now that I've reflected on who I am, I've found things that are more meaningful to me, what am I going to do with it? Am I living uh, an intentional life? And I, I can share with you here that a, a lot of the executives that we work with, they say, well, not 100%. You know, I've got golden handcuffs. I can't resign from the job I have now. I, I, what if I don't get something that pays uh, similarly? I, I have my expenses. I've got my kids in, in different schools and two, three houses, etc. cetera. Uh, but I, I really wanted to do something else with my life. So are we living an intentional life? And then um, humility is a, is a big one. And um, it allows us to keep our ego in check. It allows us to tackle our ego in a soft, humble way. So imagine it this way. You know, if you had a manager and she is one who tells the truth, she asks for the truth, she always wants the truth to be spoken in all meetings, she is clearly purpose-driven, she has a higher purpose, and her intention in every conversation, every meeting is clear as daylight. And when her ego gets the better of her, she is able to catch herself and be humble about it, admit that she's not perfect, would you trust that manager more? And everybody, regardless of where we ask, they would raise their hands and say, yes, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to have a manager like that uh, or a leader like that. And we say, well, is that the leader that you are to yourself in your own life? Are you engaging with the truth every day? Are you living a purposeful life with a clear intention? And then when you fall flat on your nose and you've made a mistake and um, your ego got the better of you, are you humble about it? Are you able to get back on your feet and move on? And once you do that, you start to, like a software programmer, know where the glitches are, where the weak spots are. And you start to trust yourself. You know, in this situation, I can be strong. In that situation, I have to watch out. And then, um, so we've, we've traveled through it a little bit now, and I'm going to show you how the pattern is. I go from truth to purpose, purpose to intention, humility, and trust. So what happens now? You know, ideally, this is a rewarding experience, although somewhat painful. So I go further. I go back to truth. And the, the more I dig into that, the more I'm likely to find things that I need to let go of. And forgiveness is really letting go of something. Remember when I first introduced the Inner Compass in 2014 at the headquarters of a major automobile maker in Munich, you can guess which one that is. I had to swallow three times before clicking my remote control because I wasn't sure I could show them forgiveness. Um, but actually, uh, a few months later, I had about 35 of them in a program where we did forgiveness exercises. And, uh, and there were a few wet, uh, eyes in, in, in the room uh, at the end of that it's a, a silent guided meditation with eyes closed and up, upon exploring that topic it, it turned out that the, the people that they had to forgive the most were themselves and from forgiveness we, we go to uh, compassion uh, if I can forgive myself and others I increase my capacity to show compassion and interestingly, as I started researching this one in, in major research done by Gallup, uh, the Gallup organization, one of the top four things that people look for in their leaders is exactly compassion. Uh, they're hoping for compassion from their leaders. And if you've come this far in the compass, um, 
you're filled with a sense of gratitude that you've that you've learned these things about yourself that you've increased your capacity for forgiveness and compassion and are therefore freer and i'm not talking about gratitude that goes hey tour great job you know have a great have a good weekend with family uh, really appreciate your hard work this week it's more the lower lip quivering uh, tear in the corner of the eye type of gratitude and uh, what that brings with it is an an opening energy where I start to trust that life is really working with me, helping me learn more. And through more trust, I shoot up the vertical axis again and go higher on the truth axis. And to make a long story short, it starts to form this pattern. And, you know, if you, if you use your imagination a little bit, you could say that it's a, it forms the, the, the number eight, a horizontal eight, which stands for eternity and signals that this work is never done. Um, once we start to walk that path, it, it goes on forever. And uh, we all know people who keep repeating the sm same small circle. And we also know people who seem to be expanding their whole lives. And uh, you could say that their uh, consciousness is expanding. You could say that they're expanding as, as personalities. Um, and that's really the, the aim of it. And if we can follow the inner compass and be truth-seeking leaders, purpose-driven, intentional, and humble, trusting that we can fulfill the purpose and keep our intention focused, forgiving ourselves and others when we make mistakes, compassionate towards ourselves and others, and grateful for what life has to show us, um, we have tremendous upside potential because there, there's no room for ego in the inner compass. Um, there's less drama, if we can get a hold of this. People are more candid and truthful around us. So candid doesn't always translate into all uh, um, cultures. More trust, better cooperation, higher interest and engagement levels, increased productivity, a much healthier company culture and loyalty. And the, the cool thing about the last one, what do we mean by that one? People are not tempted to leave because of promise of higher paychecks, or we know a few examples. They did leave because they were tempted with a higher paycheck and came back because uh, they said, that's, that's the environment I want to be in. And essentially we're asking for leaders to stand inside that cube that you see on the right-hand side bring the inner compass with them that's the floor is who am i what do i bring with me engage their team in a meaningful strategy structure the work and and and, and processes and keep an eye on the kpis that show you if you're on the right way and uh, and what's really cool to see is that corporations sometimes can be dark and cold places but the lights are being turned on in more windows all the time uh, because people are willing to become more conscious. And finally, um, who is this guy? Uh, you probably guessed it. Uh, the only one I can properly talk about here with uh, uh, enough confidence. Uh, spent a few decades on getting to know him uh, through all kinds of means. And someone who's very grateful for the opportunity to speak in a circle like this. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. And if you want to know any more, um sats already promoted it but the the book is on amazon and we have an offer for you guys i think a free download right donald uh, a free download for everyone so uh more than happy to for that to work so i'm gonna stop sharing and uh, did i stop sharing yes okay guys um sorry that took a while but i do believe we have a good half an hour uh still so whatever questions you might have, anything that you, you, you might want to uh, ask, I'm here. Free Kindle, yes. The link's in the, in the chat, guys, and it's on the meetup as well. So there, there's plenty of sources to get the link. And if anybody's got any problems, you can let me and Saf know. We'll, we'll, we'll try and help you to, to get it, okay? Michael, do you want to ask your question? I see it in the chat. Would you would you be comfortable to put it directly to Thor? Yeah, sure. Oh yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So you see my question there. I mean, I'm basically asking 
does there always have to be a driver for the behavior that we display to those around us? And does it have to be based on something that happened in our lives? And something that I believe in, um, you know, I, I kind of identify with a peacemaker thing and um, that's just the personality that I am. Does that necessarily mean that I've had experiences in my life that would um, kind of um, encourage or, um, or something, you know, uh, would basically motivate such behavior and the answer is not necessarily but um, I'm also a believer in something a bit weird which might be seen as a bit weird and I believe in the power of names and I know that the power of what um, sorry na names okay. and I know for, for example in Jewish culture in the old days um, names were were quite important um, and they set a direction for children uh, to walk in and I believe that names can have quite a severe, uh, quite a quite a major impact on people's lives. So, you know, yeah. my my second name happens to be Frederick, which means peacemaker. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I am. And, yeah. Um, so I'm I'm just wondering if there is. A, I mean, obviously, one can timeline this sort of thing and and sit down. And there are events in my own life which have not been that great, to be honest with you. Um, but um and yes they've had massive impacts on my life for years um and it, it really takes a very long time to get over some some things um not easy but yeah. um and yes it can form us it can it can form the way that we behave and the way that we that we interact with others around us and stuff like that so you know but i'm just wondering if it necessarily yeah. has to be that way yeah so um the 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 answer i would i would give is that the the only person that can answer that is each person for themselves by exploring who they are and how they became to be the person how they came to be the person that they are and uh, they may find connections or possible drivers for the behavior and they may not and i think i mentioned in the beginning the the debate is not finished on nature versus nurture. You know, what if what if uh, the peacemaker genes were in you already? Um, we don't know. But um, in that case, you know, there wouldn't have been a behavior uh, or, or an event that created your behavior. Very often, though, people can say, well, you know, when when things were tough, my mode was to be the peacemaker. Uh, it seemed to work for me then. Uh, and um, and maybe that's why I stuck with it. We tend mm. to stick with stuff that works. That's just mm. how human nature is. For sure. And, uh, it's a pattern that sure. worked for you. And you, you say, that's just who I am. That's a very typical statement. That's because we identify with who we are. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with it until it becomes a ego pattern that is too strongly interpreted at times to someone yours or other people's disadvantage mm -hmm. um you know you could because a peacemaker may sometimes avoid things a bit too long hoping they fix themselves on their own and, <laughs> i'm uh, not okay. like that <laughs> yeah i'm not like that i'm i tend to if if, if i see something um is not is not happening the right way or that something has gone wrong i tend to confront it which doesn't necessarily mean that i'm aggressive and 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 that sort of thing in my approach but i definitely do confront issues that i don't think are yeah, right. brilliant yeah mm. brilliant mm. but i think the, the the message isn't that there are always drive events that drive behavior the message is take time to explore yourself sure. and, and see what patterns you find and and sure. how they make sense to you so sure. yeah Michaela, you, uh, you've had your hand up for a while. Hi, Thor. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Actually, I had a similar question to, to uh, or related. I was going to ask how much attention or how much focus do you put on talking about subconscious patterns so that people do understand, you know, maybe the connection between their behavior and the subconscious patterns that are, uh, that are in there. And the other question I had about was around purpose. Because I do have a few clients, because I coach, you know, the leaders as well on the conscious leadership. So I do have a few clients that get actually quite agitated 
talking about purpose, the ones that do not have the purpose, you know, and they get, there is a definitely a trigger of almost feeling like, why do we keep talking about purpose? Why do I have to have a purpose? Uh, definitely ego is triggered there. So I wanted to ask you if you do have a similar experience around purpose. No, not so much. Um, I think we tend to overcomplicate purpose for a lot of people and uh, nobody has to have one any more than they want to. Um, studies show, however, that young people are wanting it more than previous generations. And uh, I think a, a short story uh, that I had with my grandmother might explain it. I, She was a, a someone who lived very long. She was 98 when she died. She was always happy. And I was sitting with her in her old age for one evening. And I asked her, Grandma, how come you're always happy? I've never seen you, you know, annoyed. And she said, Tor, it's obvious. I had four sons who all lived and on to become healthy uh, young men. We always had food on our table. We had a whole house, not an apartment. And I even got to travel. And I, I sat there and I thought, Jesus, she's, she's counting those blessings. But we take all of them for granted today. So where is the fulfillment meant to come from? If we take all these basics for granted. That we have everything in the Western world, in, 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 in England, in, in Iceland, in mainland Europe. You know, Eastern part going through some struggles at the moment. But... Um, they're looking for meaning. So if that person is in a leadership position and they want to engage and hold on to younger talent, it's simply a business decision to engage with the topic, letting alone how fulfilling it is when you find it. I'm not sure if it, if it helped, Michaela. Um, I, I would take the pressure off and, you know, in terms of them needing to have purpose. You know, it's to each their own. And when, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Um, people need to be absolutely ready for this. All right. I see... Um, Nia. I, Nia. Nia's question. When you put these ego styles to people with limited awareness, how do they respond? Do you have any interesting examples? Um, <laughs> I have a, a funny one, yeah. There was a manager who got a written report uh, about him being an eight, the boss. And then it had, in the, in the very end, that report had a strange sentence about uh, something about um, him needing to look out for his health, uh, that he was in an unhealthy state. And he came to me and he said, um, Jesus, uh, how, how does the test know about my physical issues that I have? Of course, it wasn't meant that way. They, of course, they can't know anything about his physical state. He was so firmly committed to his ego patterns that the test recognizes it and says, you're in an unhealthy relationship with your pattern. Um, a, a lot of people become defensive uh, or they simply say, uh, so what? Isn't it just a horoscope type of text? You know, they don't fully engage. But most people uh, are a little bit taken aback by how accurately this, this hits them. We spent three days in the Inner Compass Seminar uh, to really uh, bathe in this and understand the patterns and, and come to terms that the fact that maybe, maybe influential people around me um, had more impact on me in my upbringing than I uh, have been willing to face. Uh, one small example, I have three kids. My oldest son probably got the rawest version of me because I wasn't very reflected or conscious when he was growing up. And sometimes I'd catch myself saying something to him and uh, at, at a high tone of voice. And then later on, I'd say, where the heck did that sentence come from? That was my dad. We copy stuff from our past. We take it into our adulthood, and we have no idea that we took it. 
Uh, and it's all about the awareness. You know, maybe you took something, maybe you didn't. And, and it, it's, it's upon us individually to engage. So, um, Nia, they, they respond very differently. Um, interesting examples, yeah, probably a lot. If we were to uh, speak longer, it would be fun. And uh, I, I guess the most limited awareness is, okay, but I don't want to engage with it. Um, the higher the awareness, the more they want to know. AI, interesting uh, abbreviation uh, at this point in the world. Sorry, it's not, it's not, it isn't, I'll have to take that off to be honest with you though. It's actually, it's Al, that's my name. Oh, it's, it's Al. It's, All right. just, it's just with the, th the way things are at the moment, I did realize, yeah. you know what I mean? I'll have to, I'll, it's spelled with the UN, so a lot of people call us Al, but uh, um, yeah, it's nice to meet you though anyway. Fascinating facts, to be honest with you, on here and methods that you've shown today. And I, uh, I must admit, I've, I've really taken to what you've said. I just wanted to know, Thor, you know, when it comes to the, the what you introduced us to uh, with the methods, et cetera, is there a follow-up process that you've actually got that you would then, when you when you introduce these to, to groups, you know, uh, around you, that you dip back in and kind of, you know, see how they took to them. Did they use the methods? Is there something you could uh, give us any feedback on that? I'm quite interested because I know it's changed. People get really stressed on it, as you know. So whether, whether there is a process of teaching this, is that the question? It, it's almost about once you've handed these, you know, me methods over to people, do, do you actually go back at, at another time to, to follow up on how they've actually taken them on board and what, you know, what results you get? And I, I'm sure you would do that, wouldn't, wouldn't you, as a rule? Uh, it depends on the program that they or how they engage with us and uh, yeah. whether it's a short term or a longer term engagement. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, a longer term engagement, which I had with uh, 30 managers at BMW at the time. We spent nine months together um, and uh, one of them wrote the, the foreword to my book. And what Mike did was he uh, he's, he's a he's a Brit. So, you know, he, he lives in England and he at the end of the nine months, he printed it out, had it laminated and had it on his desk and used it for his daily reflection and decision-making. Whether his ego was in control or whether his wiser inner self was in control, whether it was a purposeful thing to do and, and what the purpose then was, what is my true intention here going into this yeah. meeting? So uh, that, that worked for him. And yeah. we, when we teach it, we have a process, but in, at the end of the day, we all have to find our own path. Yeah, that's what you mean, yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, it's very, it's very true. I mean, it's surprising, you know, the amount of times I'll sort of approach uh, people around me in a similar sort of fashion, you know, with something I'll offer out. Uh, yeah. And you'll go back to them, and, and it's almost like they forgot about it. Some people will forget about it. Some people will take the action they need to take. And it's almost, um, it's just like you were saying, I think we've got an individual sort of um, responsibility for ourselves to be able to kind of take this stuff on board and realize that we we are the ones that are gonna, you know, process this and actually put it out there, you know, to use it rather yeah. than somebody keep having to tell them. Does, does that make sense though? Yes, I, I think it does make sense. You know, uh, um, no, nobody can tell you anything about yourself. You need to, you need to figure it out on your own. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I really like the, exactly what you're saying there, Thor, as well. I, I realised that, you know, I was I was doing a course about behaviour myself, and it and it made me reflect on my behaviour, and I felt as if when I asked her that, I, I had a method, um, that was placed in this course, and I would then ask other people to do the same, and I, I was really surprised the amount of people that wouldn't do the same. So I'll offer out yeah. the faults I've got, the things that I do wrong, etc., and they would actually literally look at it and say nothing because they were so shocked with the fact that I'd asked them to kind of just you know ask yeah, yourself yeah. a couple of questions about how you behave etc you know it's not it's not a it's not a, a bad thing with your personality isn't it as well it would take that on board I suppose yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. thank you that's brilliant thank you uh Peter Schillen has a question here that is quite interesting do we have a problem with purpose in that we expect it to be our almost all-consuming passion 
when it doesn't have to be as much as that, just what we decide we are striving for. Um, Peter, is he Peter still with us? Could you expand on that maybe a little bit? Peter yeah, there? sorry, I am. Yeah, um, I was just uh, I thought I'd sh show my face instead of uh, asking oh, anonymously. Um, it was it was mostly relating to something that we were talking about in the chat. I think it was Michaela that was bringing it up about having problems yep. with purpose, and it it feels like it feels like there's this enormous pressure to have this all consuming purpose, and that if you're not if you're not working towards your purpose this this um you know almost divine um path that you should be on that you're somehow kind of failing yourself but a lot of people are i mean you mentioned it before about people who won't resign from a job because they have expenses or they have this or they have that um you know people people are in situations where they they are striving for things they're looking to to do things um but it's not necessarily this um all consuming passion and i'm just wondering what how how you reflect that when you talk about purpose yeah uh, I, I, you're spot on in your um uh, observation and um, i'm gonna go out on a limb and 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 say that if purpose becomes the new thing everybody has to have if it becomes hyped if it becomes trendy if it becomes valuable because it's trendy of course the egos are going to want to have it you know it's, a, it's a, it gets an upper hand through it you know and uh and that's not where purpose comes from and i don't think we should be pushing it so hard especially not the word purpose i'm, I'm a however we only have one life as far as we know and so we say to people that work with us, is yours a meaningful one? You know, are you, are you feeling that it's meaningful enough for you and your family, your kids? And they go, absolutely. You know, medium, medium income, small house, happy with my two kids, nothing special going on, but we're happy as clams. We're, we're, it's, it's my purpose in life is that the four of us are happy. Go, great as soon as purpose becomes something that you measure against other people's purposes and mine is higher and more noble and whatever it you know it's it's dangerous does that answer in any way the 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 the, the consideration yeah no it does thank you very much yeah okay um I'm just scanning the chat to see if there's any any more stuff here. Um, if anything's coming up, oh, there's uh, Jay, Jay's, Jay and Frederick's got their hand up. Yes. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, where do we start, Jay or Frederick? I think I've got a short question, so I will I will be bold and go first here. Go, um, go for it, Jay. Do you have a link to your compass diagram like online that we could download and print out and post on our walls and worship daily? <laughs> You'll find it. I don't have a, a link to it specifically. Uh, it's on my company's website and um, I'll put the company's website here on, in the chat. Awesome. And uh, you should you should find it there under um, products or tools or something like that. Uh, cool. It's also in the book. It's also in the book. Awesome. Cool. Thank you much. That's all I had. Yeah, you're welcome. So, Frederick. Thank you. So, a, a, a lot of uh, a lot of domains, disciplines, frameworks tend to label us right whether you look at mbti or enneagram or so on um they they tend to uh, highlight our strong suit and strong suit is by a lot of people assimilated to um our coping mechanisms and our ego so how do you if you agree with that 
Uh, so first, do you agree with that or do you do you see it differently? A lot of them tend to emphasize our strong suit. I do agree. When you dig deeper, uh, the, the, the one I told you about MDI Insight has what's Tor like under moderate pressure, what's he like under extreme pressure. And those were not very pretty pictures of me, you know, and uh, and to hear from a team that they were at times very true uh, was a, a revelation. Uh, so I wouldn't say it was uh, emphasizing my strong suit. It was doing both. And mm. uh, and you can study the Enneagram to the point where you go, Jesus, how, I don't want to be any of the nine. You yes, know, how exactly. can I be free of all of the nine? I don't want any of these labels. And, and that was my second question. It was where a lot of people try to be like integrate their, their four into a one, for instance, speaking about the person I know. Um, mm -hmm. Then I thought, yeah, but a one integrates in something else. So actually, aren't we trying to become what is required in the moment, in the space where we are? And so if it is the case, then what is the first breach? How do you get people to go from the, uh, oh, I'm, I'm really good at being um, a peacemaker or being um, uh, um, an individualist or an achiever or so on to, oh, I could actually become what is required right now or something else altogether. So the, so the question is just to be absolutely sure. What is the first breach? How do you, how, what are some of the ways you've gotten people to, to step out from the, oh, I'm actually really good with these labels and yeah, it has some cost, but I'm really good with that too. Oh, I'm actually uh, in for this very long journey. Yes. I mean, that's a key question. That's a key question because the, 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 the first step you describe where they're good with the labels, that's the easy one. And, yeah. um, and then to get them to explore it and, and go further, um, that's where the numbers drop uh, fast. So could you give like one or two tangible examples from, of course, not saying the names, but of um, memorable aha moments or wow. Well, um, I was at a um, I was at a book publishing party the other day. Uh, by the way, I think this group, given the conversation we're having, would uh, be interested in it. It's called "Life Worth Living" by some Yale University professors, and um, here it is. And um, and a lady walks up to me. I didn't recognize her. Um, terrible. And she, she was in a seminar in 2015 on the inner compass. And then I remembered her because she quit the company as soon as the course was over and moved to Africa uh, and went into charity work. And she said, I don't know if you were aware of it. Uh, I, I, when I saw you were here, I wanted you to know uh, I'm still there and I'm still exploring who I am. And while that is a massive inspiration for me, um, it says much more about her because she saw enough to become hungry for more. And she found her own paths leading her to more. And maybe I'm, you know, in my job, I'm just a spark. And, and sometimes the fire is lit and sometimes the spark dies out. Um, in the, in the inner compass retreat for three days, we, we take people on a super, super intensive journey through meditation, mindfulness, trauma release exercises, uh, all in a leadership context, in a corporate leadership context. Um, and then we do offer follow-up, but many of them do not take it. They say, fantastic, three days. I will never be the same person. Maybe they went back to the, the old pattern. Um, yeah. So... Um, yeah, I, I mean, trillion dollar question. Uh, Sheila, you, you've had your hand up. I'm not sure who was Michaela or, or Sheila. Michaela, I, I'm not sure who's first. Michaela was first. Okay, so Michaela, you go. Sheila, go. I already had a question, so, so go. <laughs> um, do you find, I, I may have missed this because I got a couple of interruptions, but do you find that under 
pressure that people usually get more the same or do people um, surface different of those nine types in so, a crisis? So, so when you when we study the the enneagram, um, so I'm a a seven, but I have a very so-called strong eight wing, meaning eight is also very strong in me, and uh, and both go to five, which is the investigator, for different reasons though. So yes, you can show more than one of the patterns from the enneagram, uh, meaning more than one ego pattern. <laughs> depending on the situation that you're in. But over time, if, you're, if you stay the way you are, those patterns become pretty stable and, uh, and you react in similar ways in similar situations. Um, so unless you're constantly developing and, 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 um, and connecting with other parts of the Enneagram, which it's theoretically possible and, and and gurus have and psychologists have talked about it but it's hard um, but i'd say mostly the same patterns come up in again and again and again to make it clear the pacifist the harmonious number nine um will not suddenly uh frequently become the aggressive number eight they may do it on occasion if they're pushed absolutely to the limit but they're never going to be predominantly that one uh, that's unlikely to happen did that answer the question sheila um, or did i misunderstand you I'm not sure if it answered the question or not. I know that my sister said she took some sort of a test mm. where most people just get more and more the same on, in a crisis, but that she typically, when things were normal, it sounded like she was probably would in this group of nine would probably have been the boss. But, mm. but if there was a problem, uh, she would go to a totally different personality type. And I think it might have depended on what she thought was the one that would solve the problem the best. I think I might do the same thing. What, so what, I don't think that's what, what you're did saying. she do? She would go to a different one. And I think it would depend on what the situation was and what she thought would resolve whatever the issue was, whether she might become the investigator or she might become the peacemaker or she might be one of the others. Um, that's interesting, Sheila. The the nine, the peacemaker, is uh, has a nickname. Um, the um, the chameleon of the enneagram. They take on different characters, and seeing as it sits next to eight, she might be a nine with a strong eight wing, uh, making her appear uh, uh, somewhat the boss, but being able to adjust. But uh, that's, you know, we. I don't want to go too bit too deep into the Enneagram as such. It's only a tool to help people understand that we all have patterns. And when 15 people sit together in a, a program and there are several number sevens or several number eights, and they start to realize that they have had similar life patterns, similar experiences, similar reactions, and those patterns are uh, become clearer. And that's the only thing we want to establish that we have them, what am I going to do with them? Am I happy with them? Fine. That's it. Do I want to uh, work on them and be freer of them? Great, let's do that. Um, but it's a, a, just an awareness piece. Okay, looking at the clock, Michaela. Yeah, just a quick question. To, just interested when you do the three-day um... Uh, three-day uh, programs do you go through the whole compass or do you tend yes. to focus on one part or is it no, depending on the, the client we go through the whole compass and then there's the option of coming to a a, a follow-up uh, retreat uh, another three days for a, a deepening of of it all but we mm. go through the whole thing mm. okay cool thanks
Okay, I have a, a there's a brilliant question from Nick here. Where's Nick? Is he still there? Uh, a long one here in the chat, but um, yeah, I'm here for. Yeah, so when I first started taking my development seriously, I, I traveled from one guru to the next to different seminars, etc. And in one of those seminars, I heard the term spiritual tourist, uh, meaning that you get all into it for the two, three days that the seminar lasts, and then you go back to your reality and you go back to your old patterns. And you can't wait for the next rush when you go to another retreat. And finding the balance in everyday life and saying, you know, can I stay aware and stay conscious, even though, though everything around me seems not there, um, takes time and practice. And um, you say, you know, tried a few roles in the last 18 months, but can't accept the, the, the levels of toxicity of more mature management. Um, there, there's a brilliant book called The Four Agreements written by Miguel uh, Ruiz. And, you know, once, once you wake up to certain things in life um, and your family members, your friends, the people around you haven't, you know, what are you going to do? You can't go back to sleep on it. It's, it's there now. It becomes very lonely, doesn't it? It does become very lonely, Nick. And we we look we look for uh, communities where we can connect with other ones that are on a similar path. That's why conscious leadership uh, is something that Sat and me and a bunch of other people are trying to uh, spread because we need we need the inspiration from each other. We need the experience of each other. We we need the energy and support of each other. It does become a very lonely place. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Iman, welcome. Okay, folks, I think we'll almost call it a day at that. Um, that was really great. If you want to continue the conversation, you're welcome. You can do it through the meetup links or connect directly on LinkedIn. And we'll try and get back to you with, with, with any questions that you may have over the next few days or, or ongoing. We've put quite a lot of information in the chat tonight. There's various links with discounts. Uh, hopefully you can take advantage of them. Has there anybody got any community announcements before we wrap up that they want to share? Okay, if anything comes to mind, again, you can welcome to pop it in the, in the, in the chat within the meetup or in the community LinkedIn channel as well. You're welcome to join that. We'll also get the recording out to you as soon as possible in the next couple of days. And just really want to thank Thor and Kate, who's in the background there supporting us for all the wonderful things and resources they've given us. So just maybe a wee round of applause, everybody. And look forward to catching you same time next month. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.